Thank you for joining us for our Brothers to Brothers segment. We have the opportunity to be graced by one of our founding members, the Dr. Willie Clemens, and just wanted to say it's a pleasure to be here with you today, sir. Oh, and it's an honor. Yes. Absolutely. And I just want to let members know and let people know that when I first got hired, you were the first voice I heard to congratulate me, and I just want to say I appreciate that for the bond that we have. Uh, for the family that we share in Mobile, Alabama, and just for your words of wisdom that have carried me to where I'm at today. Well, it was an honor. I, I was very proud when I heard that you were assuming the, uh, the, the role as CEO for the 100 Black Men of Atlanta. I, I, I knew that you brought with you all the leadership skills and was familiar with your background at Rick Morales College, the whole nine yards in the family, friend, and so thank you. And again, very, very happy to see you serving in this capacity. Well, thank you, sir. And I will also say that I remember attending the cabaret. Oh, okay. And I remember when the song, the Odyssey song came on and I heard your voice. Can you say, can you just say that for us? How do you say it? Le cabaret, le cabaret, le cabaret. <laughs> so when we have the gala this next year coming up, I would love to hear that if you're able to come in. Oh, I would be more than happy to. Yes, more than yes. happy to do. Because I think just, just this distinction of seeing the brothers walk in with the white coats, the song and the voice is just amazing to see and to hear. Well, and it's good for me that, that to start that tradition and seeing that tradition is being continued. Uh, well, we were very excited uh, of being able to do something significant and unique and different in the city. And Le Cabaret did just that during that time. And uh, one of the highlights was that we had Phyllis Hyman <laughs> uh, as the featured entertainment. So that was good. But glad to see that you're we continuing to do that. Yes. Well, if we could just talk a little bit, if you could just tell us a little bit about what it was like growing up in Mobile. Um, if I'm not mistaken, I think you, you actually grew up with Hank Aaron at the time. So, so, you know, and again, he was one of our members here, STEAM members, of course. But just kind of give us a little bit about your background and then you also go into like, your, you know, the book to kind of tell us, you know, how you got to where you're at today. Well, the, life for me has been a journey, uh, but it's been a magnificent <laughs> journey. And it began in Mobile, Alabama. And it began as with most of us, with our families. I come from a, a very puritanical, but a very, very loving family. Uh, I was reared by my, my, my grandfather and uh, my grandmother who uh, died early on, and, and my mother who was in New York at that time. And as what happened during that time was that that was the migration to the south. So my mother left going to New York to find a better way of life for us. And my grandparents would not allow her to take me mm -hmm. with her. So that's why I was raised by, by them and by, uh, by my aunts. But it was a community that was key. The church was significant. It played a vital role. Uh, in, in our lives. And so that was the core along with the school. And that helped shape me along with very strong black men who were everyday people, everyday in the sense that they were not, say, quote, just professionals, but they worked hard, they took of their family, they were faith driven, mm -hmm. and they, they showed the love and the kind of, of of, of, of respect, which they demanded, but they were also uh, disciplinarians. <laughs> you know, we were allowed at that time that uh, they could definitely say, whip us, if yeah. that's a term that we could use. We used it at that time yeah. uh, when they saw us getting out of line. So it was a community effort. The extended family was quite significant, yeah. and that helped shape me. But I come from a family who provide service. My grandfather was that. He was my, my role model mm -hmm. and uh, the very first. And so what he did, what you see me do on a smaller scale, he did in the community. So he was an idol. Uh, and I learned from that experience of giving back, mm -hmm. of, of working with uh, the least of us. Mm -hmm. And so that's what helped propel my journey. And so that has taken me from from, from Mobile, Alabama, went to school to Alabama State in Montgomery, was involved with the civil rights movement and 
worked very closely with, uh, as I said, the Martin Luther King Jr., who was in Montgomery at that time, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, with Abernathy, and then eventually getting with, uh, moving, moving to Atlanta, Congressman Lewis and uh, Andy Young and the whole nine yards. So it could go on and on and on, but you see the pattern. Right. But at the core of this was, uh, how can I make a difference and have an impact on the lives of others just as that impact was, an opportunity was given to me. But I love how you connect your past, you know, and the work that you did to the current work and what you imparted here and that you continue to do. And I think for me, when I, um, you know, when I heard Ambassador Young earlier speaking about how his wife, Jean, started, you know, and, I'm, and the way I understand is that she helped start Atlanta Metropolitan State College, Metropolitan State College at that time, but that she brought you on board. Yeah, we, it was um, between 20 and 25 of us that opened the school. I was... We were in suburbia, Chicago, um, and uh, I had gotten my doctorate and was uh, a professor at uh, College of DuPage, and the opportunity came for us, we had a one-year-old, to, uh, to look at other opportunities and had an offer to go to San Francisco or to come to Atlanta, mm -hmm. and we chose Atlanta because it was in close proximity to our families in, Mo in Mobile. My wife, Leteria, has a large family, very close-knit. I had a very, very small family, and, uh, but we wanted our children to, to have that experience of growing up with their cousins and aunts and uncles and grandfolks and all. So we moved to Atlanta, and that was one of the reasons. And as, as fate would had it, it was really uh, the gene, and Andy was very busy because he was congressman at mm -hmm. that time. They had a one-year-old son, and they took us under their umbrella and the rest of history. I met so many, many people mm -hmm. uh, as a result of that relationship with, mm -hmm. uh, with, with them. I, looking at what Atlanta Metropolitan State College is today, I would consider it probably another historical black college because sure. of the population which it serves and, and of course where it's the location. And even though know, it's a state college, you know, that's what I do consider it. And um, I have to say that I do admire that the work you've done in higher ed, and, you know, I know you haven't talked about it a lot, you know, during the meeting today, but if you could just share a little bit of the wisdom of what prepared you to get to where, you know, to finish a doctorate and then impart the wisdom of what you learned along the way working from Atlanta Metropolitan State College then to Morehouse School of Medicine where you retired. Well, yeah, the, and historically, we were limited, uh, say, in the, the 40s and the 50s with professions that we could go uh, into. Uh, we, there were not corporations, and, uh, uh, and there were just very limited business owners. I mean, you could count the, the number of those. But uh, those service areas was, was really open to us. And, 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 and uh, uh, you know, teaching was one. Um, and there were a few um, doc medical doctors, and that has, has changed. You know, now we have more. There were no female medical doctors at that time. They were all males. It's surprising now that that has reversed. And that's another story. But, but at any rate, I was limited. And so that was the thing that I, that I chose to do. Uh, being in an area where I could make a difference in the lives of others, just as I said earlier, that, that had been offered me. And uh, so teaching was that. But I didn't, my initial teaching experience was in Mobile. I, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to come back after graduating from Alabama State and teach there. But in doing that, I recognized that, that I had a greater calling. I wanted to do more uh, at, at the college level, but in order to do that, I had to go back to, uh, to, to school. Uh, and there's a series of things that's also mentioned in, 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 in the book. We were not allowed to go to the University of Alabama and the Auburn and the white mm -hmm. institutions as, as such. And it was until uh, 
our family friend Vivian Malone Jones, mm -hmm. who integrated that. But uh, for me, I had already graduated from college, had gone, so I couldn't go there. Um, and but and the strangely enough, that the state of Alabama paid for me to go to Indiana University to, go, uh, to get my master's rather than allowing me to go to the University of Alabama. Uh, and that's how I got my graduates both at, at, at IU. Um, and then I did one year at the University of Mississippi post-masters. And then when Latir and I got married, I was on the faculty at Tuskegee and uh, wanted to get the doctorate. And that's when we got the opportunity to move to suburban Chicago to do two things, one to teach at the, at the College of DuPage, but also to get my doctorate. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened. Coming to Atlanta, working uh, at the uh, Atlanta Junior College certainly was an experience. And uh, it, it was a unique experience. It was certainly a good one for me because I moved from working in an all, not all, 99.9% wealthy community of whites at the College of DuPage, coming south and dealing with 99% uh, African Americans, and, and most were high risk mm -hmm. who had graduated from high school and had come to Atlanta because it was a transition for me, but it was one that I wanted to do because I felt as though that this was my way of giving back. And it was there that, that, that with Gene, the late Gene Young and others of us that, that really, really did that. And I will also tell you one of the things that happened tying into the 100, when we, with our Project Success students, when we found that our students who were sophomores were, were not be able to graduate uh, in two years. We panicked, we said, we gotta do something in order to make this happen. We have stepped out on there. This, we nationally said what we were doing, we were gonna pay for their education. These students that are gonna graduate on time, all of that, but they were failing and what we did, we had to come up with $150,000 to start the Sat Satter Academy. And we started it at Atlanta Junior College on That's Saturday right. morning. And I think That's I shared it. that it, with Elliot and all those guys, we went and drug them out of bed and made sure that they did all of that. But that was what the, the, the school did. And so once I decided to, uh, you know, to, to move, to transition, uh, the opportunity came for me to come to Morehouse School of, of Medicine with a different role and, and mm -hmm. all of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I, I, I landed. Uh, the 100 started when I was at Atlanta, and I will tell you, got the support of the institution, as you could very well see, in supporting us. Mm -hmm. uh, and then with, with, with my fraternity and other things in in the community, those institutions were support systems. One of the things as I had also mentioned earlier that with the black college presidents, male black college presidents, members of the organization, how they contributed was to, they hosted our meetings on, on, mm -hmm. on their campus. Mm -hmm. And that was, and so we did it for any number of reasons. But two, one was that it provided they had the state of the art for meeting. They had all the technology and mm -hmm. they had all of that. They had the food service. We did everything and mm -hmm. that was that. But the other part was to, for the students to see us coming on campus. We were always dressed. At our meetings, we came dressed with shirt and ties. Mm -hmm. Um, and they saw us mm -hmm. coming and meeting and, and all of that. So that's developed a presence with those particular institutions mm -hmm. that, that when I left move, uh, and retired from Morehouse School of Medicine, they were still doing that. Mm -hmm. So, and that's why we had the president of Morehouse, the uh, 
School of Medicine as a member up until uh, Dr. Montgomery mm -hmm. Rice, president of Clark, president of Morehouse, mm -hmm. were all members of, and the president of Atlanta Metropolitan, were members of the 100 Black mm -hmm. Men. And they gave their institutions uh, as support from there. So that's exactly what we did. That's mm -hmm. a relationship that we, that we had with them. And that was that particular commun commitment that we are here to serve and to make a difference in our community. Now, thank you for sharing. I think something that I heard um, Dr. Walter Young speak to earlier, um, he, as he said, was the true founding of our, our organization was that um, it was a Christmas party or a get together. And, New you know, Year's Eve. <laughs> it was a New Year's Eve event. And just, you know, and I can just think, you know, this is Atlanta in the mid 80s and just the change that was going on culturally that was happening, you know, and not only in Atlanta, but in our nation. Right. And just hearing and seeing, you know, I knew at that time the progressiveness that was happening in Atlanta and that was happening here, with, um, especially men of color. Right. And to, you know, that just, I guess, just made, made Atlanta so unique and then our chapter so unique is that you had so many um, men who were prominent, politics, education, um, business, um, you know, the technologies were really coming here. They were moving in, you know, just the self-starting, you know, this was known as Chocolate City outside of Washington, D.C. Absolutely. And if you could speak a little bit to what the nostalgia was at that time, you know, I know he said that they, you know, joking, they were like, oh, you know, just put a hundred dollars in and go for it. But, you know, I do tell that story with my funders, you know, because I, I always let them know that this was self-started by men of color, that we didn't come out asking for a handout. We actually self-started and was self-supported and then later on incorporated into the 501c3. Right. And when they hear that perspective, it's different. Absolutely. Is there anything you can share with me on share with us on that? Oh yes. And and uh Walt was uh, was was spot on that it 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 started here, but Nate had had conversations with uh Dr. Haley uh, and and those it was quite ironic that 100 black men of America became official the same time that the 100 black men did. Uh, because early on, going back to, uh, to the 50s and the 60s, that was called 100 black men and the David Dinkins and all those started so that New in York, New yeah. York. Yes. But there was not chapters, that was that particular group and what they did, they didn't want to become an organized organization. There were four cities, the New Jersey, New York, Los Angeles, and Indianapolis mm -hmm. that had we did, they weren't called chapters, the groups were similar. Mm -hmm. We became number five, and but it was the push to make it come under one umbrella, mm -hmm. and that umbrella was the 100 Black Men of America. So that's how that started, and as I said, it was done pretty much simultaneously <laughs> when we started uh, there. Mm -hmm. We were in existence for six months, and we hosted the first national convention, mm. uh, which is again six months and we had to turn things around. Uh, it was the Western Hotel uh, and it was just well done. We did the little cabaret. Mm -hmm. All of that was tied in there together. But we were self-starting in the sense that we wanted to create our own mm -hmm and start our own. Uh, and early on, that's what we did. We put in X number of dollars. We put in the hundred dollars to get you know things organized. And a lot of guys like Nate and those put in a little more because there were some things that mm -hmm. needed to. We hosted our meetings like uh, in in our home because it was just 19 of us. So we could meet at some of them. We had Mac, Mac Wilbur, Joe Harmon, all of those we met there mm -hmm. organizing that so we started all of this and created uh, the the structure of the of of the organization but we did but as i said in 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 the history we but we certainly realized that we could only go but so far mm -hmm. if we were going to do that because the focus 
we didn't want to be just another social organization, although we started socially. I mean, we, we, we were friends. We, all, we were very close friends. We saw each other. So, and Atlanta was hot at that time. We were all young. Mm -hmm. We had young children, our families. We were young professionals. And so we all know that that was key. But I think that at some point that, the, that, and I have to take my hat off to Nate and say, well, wait a minute, we really need to do a little more than just party. And so we need to do something to contribute, mm -hmm. to add to the quality, to, to give back and so forth. And that's really, really yeah. what, what, what started that, in which we did. It was strangely enough that one of, and I, and I hate to use the term, but it was true, uh, Dillard Munford, who owns 7-Elevens, the 7-Elevens here, mm -hmm. and a lot of this, he was a white, somewhat known racist, uh, called Nate and asked him to come to his office. He wanted to talk to him. He had heard about, you know, what we were doing and self-starting and that, and he was quite impressed with that. And he gave Nate, Nate came out with the check for $50,000 wow. to help jumpstart to keep this going. Nate didn't go in to ask. He didn't know what he was going <laughs> to, uh, to say. And here's this man who we'd known have had a history of there. But that's what he did. And that's how we were able to hire Monica Douglas, the first um, there. And that's how that process mm -hmm. started. Um, but we recognized suddenly that we, that, and we will always remember Jesse Jackson sharing this, that access and relationships are key. If you really want to have, and I think you've heard that throughout the conversation yes. today, if one has the access, then they can open doors, they could do that. Well, we were limited. We could, you know, the power of people who were in, were in power were the Maynards, mm -hmm. the Andes, the John Lewis, the Carl Wares, mm -hmm. the Hank Aarons, and all of those situations. They were the ones who could open the doors. Mm -hmm. And so we recruited them in to join our ranks. And that's what they exactly they did. That was their role. We knew that they were not going to be able to deal with the day-to-day -day of trying to get to the school and to the student because they were running cities and countries <laughs> and the world, but they did what they were supposed to do to move yes. the organization forward. And so that's how we evolved. We've always wanted to be, and that as a part of, of, of our mission and our goal, whereas to be a self-supporting mm -hmm. organization, Jim George, the late Jim George, who was former president and was a vice president, executive vice president at the Georgia Power Company, always said before he died, we want to make each other rich. That was his particular thing. What do we do in terms of, of supporting each other? And so what we had, and which I, I, I wasn't, I obviously didn't have time to go through all of that, but we supported each other. All of, we had 25 physicians in the organization. All of my physic, our family physicians were black and they were members of the 100 because you had all, in this city you had all specialties. Yes. Same thing in terms of <laughs> law. We could do that. So that's the people that we had. So we were supportive of each other. Not only were we friends, but then we supported each other to help us move the particular needed. There was that sense of brotherhood, yes. just as I shared with you, the little situation in terms of when Nate said, oh no, I don't have to worry about it. I'll pay their dues. Yes. And that's what he did. Yes. So that's what the brotherhood, the camaraderie, mm -hmm. and all that made this tight knit group very, very strong and supportive and making a difference here. Yeah, I was gonna bring back the educational standpoint with Alonzo Krim. And, uh, you know, of course, touch on because Alonzo Krim, when I was in elementary school, he was in Oakland, California, and he's a new. You know, I know you're alpha. <laughs> we'll forgive you for that one. <laughs> but uh, I just know that, you know, once I became, you know, I knew when I took this role that, how can I say, the legacy of me being a student under Alonzo Krim 
in Oakland, California, then him coming here, being one of the founding chapter members here, then not only that being but the super, first black superintendent of Atlanta Public School, just that, just that mantra of education and just seeing how he selected. He, he didn't go to the one, the school that was like, you know, the, the highest supporting, he went to where the most need was. And I think for us, people need to understand, and I know he can point to that, how, you know, you look at the men who were very successful and you, you know, some people would assume they were able to pick the different school or different section of Atlanta, but they say we're going to where the most need is. Yes, um, Dr. Alonzo Krim, we call him Lonnie, and his wife Gwen, who was my colleague, because she was one of the ones who started Atlanta Metropolitan mm -hmm. College uh, as well. Um, uh, but as, as a founding member here, and we decided to go that obviously our focus was going to be education, and Lon was the superintendent of schools, uh, we asked him and his staff if he would select a school that had the, the, the greatest need. Archer High School had the highest dropout rate of the schools in the Atlanta Public School at that particular time. Uh, and there were all in the, where it was located in the Perry home that's no longer existing here right. now. But the, it was the housing project and all. And so that was the decision that he came back with. Mm -hmm. And we accepted it because we asked him to make that choice. And that's exactly what we did. Mm -hmm. uh, he was a powerhouse mm -hmm. who knew the education system. Uh, he advised us. We had access to a lot of things there because him being a member and uh, certainly supporting that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, he recommended the principal of the school as a member uh, uh, as well. So we had the principal of the school along with him. But his, his whole thing was definitely um, moving the needle, the education, and he was really committed to providing service to those, especially those, the least yes. of us. Yes. Uh, and he was a part of the one of the decision that we said that we should always have mm. the superintendent of school, the male superintendent mm -hmm. of school. And, and we followed that for that because after him came Jerome um, Harris and other males who were were, who were superintendent that were members. Yes. No, well, thank you for sharing that. And um, in closing, um, it, just if you could reflect on one person who was a mentor to me, um, Dr. Asa Hilliard. Oh my goodness. Yes. Asa, <laughs> uh, how can I say this <laughs> in, in, in the sense, no, seriously, and, and I think about it, not only in terms of the first friendship and the commitment, he too was another person that supported the 100 to the nth degree. Mm -hmm. uh, and his, what he did at Georgia State and all around the world, I know he spoke, he was in high demand mm -hmm. to speak in terms of that. And so he was gone a lot. But anytime that we ask him to do something, that's what I meant about managing our members yes. and having specific roles that they could pay based upon their time, they'll get it done. They may not be able to do it at the exact time we need it, but based upon the schedule, they would get it done. Asa was that person. Mm. He uh, was very, very committed to this organization and, and uh, contributed. I always, <laughs> I always had to remind him uh, when his dues were due, it was no problem <laughs> paying, until, or when his assessment was due for the cap, all of that. And then to a point I got, I stopped calling him and started calling Patsy Joe. Yes. <laughs> did bother her. So she, as I did with many of the spouses, <laughs> took care of those kinds of yes. things as well. But to the answer to your question, very, 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 very much engaged yes. in, uh, in, in, in the 100. Yes.
Yeah. Now, the reason I ask is twofold is, um, you know, he was a mentor of mine when I was growing up in California, then got to know him here, of course, in Georgia. Um, his son, Hakeem, came and spoke to us um, last year and also is a member. But I always remember um, just his laughter, his care for students and his focus. And, and, and then also just um, we uncovered, Ray was able to share with me uh, from the program, he had put a PowerPoint together. Uh, basically of how to run project success mm -hmm. from a comedic standpoint. Oh, yeah. So we're starting to integrate some of those teachings that he did from, you know, when he was over the programs and what he preached, we're bringing that back into the fold oh, now that is just to carry that legacy and that yeah. connection. Absolutely. And just want to thank you for, you know, for you sharing that with us. But, oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. He, he, he would love that for sure, by all means. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that this is what we say to you guys that you all are the next wave of leadership. You're the leadership now and 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 you and hopefully that you will continue those sorts of things. That's why I think it's so important that we we understand the history and the shoulders that you are standing on and what they did and some of those tactics, although it's a new day, but racism is 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 still alive yes. and all of the things that's happening uh, to us in the 56, 60s are so coming back again. Yes. So you have to be prepared to deal with those. We didn't allow those to define us. We conquered those things, yes. but we work collectively. And I think that again, under you all's leadership and what you're doing here, you will make a tremendous impact in this community. Well, thank you, Dr. Clemens. In closing, I would like to say, what is it that you would love to be remembered for your legacy with the 100 Black Men of Atlanta? Of, of making an impact, of making a difference in the lives of others. I think you, you, you see where I became very emotional in reference yes. to Elliot because I see yes. the, the impact and many, many, many others yes. that have gone on that, the lives that we are touch. And so I would like to be remembered mm -hmm. in terms of, 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 of that. How did I help someone? How am I strengthening the community mm -hmm. by helping those in needs. Yes. That's my mantra. Yes. And uh, I, I want to, uh, to, be, to be remembered uh, that I had the courage and the strength. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I stand before God of saying with the talents that he, he gave me, I hope that I used all of them uh, as I leave this earth. And I thank him for that. But thank you, Dr. Clemens, for your gift of time. Always my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay.